the intense Ottoman Habsburg rivalry, which was rooted in generations of territorial contest, as well as the disputed legacy of the Roman Empire, came to a head during the reigns of two exceedingly powerful monarchs. Suleiman the Lawgiver, or Suleiman the Magnificent, arguably the most powerful, the greatest of all Ottoman sultans, and on the Habsburg side, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, the Habsburg Charles V. Now, the sh great showdown between the Habsburgs and the Ottomans might have come decades before, around the time that the Ottomans took Constantinople, uh, around the time when the Habsburg, you know, Archduke of Austria, Frederick IV, was crowned Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope, you know, with Charlemagne's crown. But back then, a kingdom stood in the way, the formidable kingdom of Hungary. And formidable Hungary was. See, Hungary at this time was led by the great Ottoman nemesis, Janusz Hunyadi. Janusz Hunyadi, who'd actually had some success on the battlefield against the Ottomans, which was exceedingly rare. And he'd had his share of failures too, but he'd succeeded when it counted. Specifically, he succeeded against the Ottomans in 1456. So just a few years after the Ottomans had taken Constantinople, Janusz Hunyadi beat them back when the Ottomans attempted to extend their empire into Central Europe, and specifically into Hungary, they met at Belgrade, the White Fortress of Belgrade, and Janusz Hunyadi and his forces were ready to meet them. And ultimately, the Ottomans packed up and went home. And Hungary was more or less safe from an Ottoman retry for the next you know, half century under the leadership of Janusz Hunyadi, and then eventually his son, Matthias Corvinus. In fact, the Kingdom of Hungary was so powerful that it expanded during this period at the expense of both the Habsburgs and the Ottomans. After the death of Matthias, Hungary declined rapidly. Now the stage was set for the Great Showdown. In 1519, Charles, the Habsburg Charles, who was already Lord of Spain as successor of Ferdinand of Aragon, who was already Lord of the Low Countries, the inheritor of the Low Countries and Burgundy, succeeded his grandfather Maximilian to become Lord of the Habsburg lands of Germany and Austria. The next year, 1520, Suleiman I succeeded his father, Selim I, as Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, inheriting a domain whose territory stretched, you know, from recently conquered Mamluk Egypt, stretches of the Arabian Peninsula, all the way up to Crimea, southern Ukraine, and Serbia. These two men now stared each other down. Charles from his imperial capital at Toledo in Spain, in other words, on the far western side of Europe, and Suleiman from his imperial capital at Constantinople, Istanbul, Istanbul, Constantinople, on the eastern side of Europe, straddling Europe and Asia there. Now Charles, among his many titles, included there Lord of Asia and Africa. Suleiman, in addition to his many Afro-Eurasian titles, included King of Kings, that ancient appellation, King of Kings, and even Possessor of the Kingdoms of the world. Now, in addition to this, much of the land that Charles claimed, including Athens and Jerusalem, was actually controlled by Suleiman. Some of the territory that Suleiman claimed, like the Mediterranean, was actually, at least in part, controlled by Charles. Charles was the closest thing Europe had seen to a universal monarch. And you have to go back to the Roman Empire, to classical times. Meanwhile, Suleiman ruled over an empire that straddled Afro-Eurasia. You know, I mean, you'd have to go back to the Arab empires to find something, you know, centuries before, to find something comparable. In addition, Suleiman ruled over much of Islamdom, including, thanks to the conquest of his father, the Hejaz, the heart of Islamdom, Mecca and Medina. On the other side, Charles believed that his family's conquests in ages past had been carried out by the grace of God. Now, these are territories that must never be surrendered and that God would come to his aid again if needed. Where these two mega domains met in the middle, that is in Hungary and the Balkans and also in the Mediterranean, it's pretty much destined to be a bloody struggle for power and prestige. And so it was that just a year after his coronation, Suleiman prepared his armies and marched on Belgrade again. And this time there would be no Janos Hunyadi. This time there would be no White Knight, the White Fortress. In fact, there was something like 700 men garrisoning Belgrade. 
this last bastion of a very divided Christian Europe. There was no help from Hungary or really anywhere else, and Belgrade fell. Just a few years later, Suleiman and his forces, this 1526, routed the Hungarian army led by its king at Mohac. And the Hungarian king died while, you know, he drowned while escaping. So southern Hungary, really all of Hungary, was thrown open to Suleiman. And he and his forces marched cautiously into Buda, pillaged, ransacked the city, and then retreated. Well, not only did the Ottomans now control southeast Hungary, but the Hungarian king, who had been childless, was now dead. So the question is, who now gets to rule Hungary? Who now gets to rule this very pivotal Central European buffer? Of course, the Habsburgs, they've got their man, Charles's younger brother, Ferdinand. He claims he's the rightful ruler of Hungary based on some previous agreements. He has some Hungarian uh, noble support. Of course, the Ottomans, they want to turn Hungary into a loyal, tribute-paying vassal. And they have their man, a Transylvanian noble named John Zaplia, who uh, also has some Hungarian noble support. So there's this rivalry going on. 1527, Ferdinand, under Charles's authority, marches in and takes Buda. But two years later, the Ottomans march in and take it back. But this time, they're not going to ransack and then retreat. They're going to keep going to Vienna. Now, Suleiman's army was massive, something like 300,000 troops, potentially, at least 150,000, it seems. Janissaries, Sepahis, John Zapolia's army, various Balkan peoples, others, all led slowly to Vienna. Now the people of Vienna scrambled to defend themselves, many of them, most of them, taking on some sort of military role or military support. You had Spanish musketeers sent by Charles V to help defend the city, uh, German mercenaries, pikemen, that may have played a pivotal role in saving Vienna, also here to assist. And then they waited. And eventually Suleiman's massive army shows up and for a couple weeks tried to breach the walls. Of course, the walls had been heavily fortified. Couldn't do it. It rained a lot and then it snowed a lot. Just like it's sort of snowing now and it is cold. And this convinced Suleiman to turn around. He probably would have stayed actually. He was probably a lot more comfortable than his men. His Janissaries complained a lot. Eventually, anyway, he turns around and he packs up and leaves. A few years later, he tried to come take Vienna again. But in that instance, he was delayed in the part of Hungary controlled by the Habsburgs. So he never made it to Vienna the second time. Now, Suleiman may not have taken Vienna, but he did take Buda and he guaranteed that Hungary would be more or less Ottoman for a very, very long time. On the other hand, the Habsburgs had held off the Ottomans. The Habsburgs had survived. Now the Habsburgs were the great bastion of a very divided Christian Europe. And this certainly contributed to the crowning as Holy Roman Emperor of Charles V in 1530. He now wears Charlemagne's crown. Very sacred responsibility in his eyes. But the rivalry is just getting started. It shifts now from Hungary and the Balkans to the Mediterranean, where Suleiman is building a much renewed Ottoman fleet under the leadership of the famous Barbarossa. And this fleet is dealt a blow, a great loss at Tunis in 1535 by Charles and his forces. But in 1538 at Preveza is able to sort of revenge that defeat and establish Ottoman naval supremacy in the Mediterranean, which is a big deal, at least certainly in the Eastern Mediterranean. Spanish power, and thus Habsburg power, is based in large part on its naval supremacy. So this is a major development and combined this with, you know, consistent Barbary pirate attacks on the Spanish coast and the Italian coast. This is a big deal and signals a, a wind change in terms of power. Very, very worrying to the Habsburgs. Meanwhile, in Hungary, in 1541, the forces of Charles V tried to retake Buda, but the forces of Suleiman I pushed them back and foisted upon the Habsburgs a very demeaning treaty, a treaty in which, in essence, 
Charles V, this treaty is directly between Charles V and Suleiman I. Charles V had to recognize, officially recognize, Ottoman control over virtually all of Hungary. In fact, the Habsburgs were only able to retain their Hungarian lands by paying the Ottomans an annual sum. So very humiliating for Charles V. Not to mention, remember all those titles. Charles V was referred to in the treaty merely as the King of Spain. Well, in the mid-1550s, Charles V abdicated his many thrones one by one and retired to a monastery where three years later he died of malaria. A few years after that, 1566, Suleiman I also died, but not in a monastery. He died on campaign, of course, right here in Hungary, on his way to Vienna to try and take it again. Of course, he never made it that time, but the rivalry between Charles V and Suleiman I kicked off centuries of direct competition between the Ottomans and the Habsburgs. This is a rivalry, the historical ramifications of which still reverberate loudly today.